Wow, thank you very much. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, it's good to be here. Great to be here. My name is John, and I'm your friend. <laughs> and on the count of three, give me your name. One, two, three. Yeah. Nice to meet you. I'm so excited to be at Bayside. What a great church. Do you have uh, worship like this every week? Mm. When you go to heaven, you're going to want to come home on the weekend, aren't you? Huh? <laughs> Just go. Yeah, you really will. That was, that was great worship, and I'm so excited to be with uh, Randy. You do know, I know, I'm sure you know. But if you don't know, you're about to know. (laughs) Randy's not only a dear friend, he's an incredible man of God, and he is an amazing church leader. You know that, don't you, huh? Isn't it wonderful to have Randy and Amy, their family, their team, just, they're beautiful people, and so it's such a joy to be here with you, and um, And I want to talk to you about purpose, okay? How many of you would like to know God's purpose for your life, huh? All right. In fact, fact, just tell your neighbor, I'd I'd like to know God's purpose for my life. Just tell them that. I would like to. In fact, look, I'm saying, I'd like like you to know God's purpose for your life, too. Well, the good news is, in in just a few minutes, every one of us are going to know what his purpose would be for us. And Jesus was teaching in the passage is going to come on the screen in Matthew chapter 5. And literally, he, he tells us why we're to be here. In fact, this passage starts with the phrase, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and we'll end up in the garbage. Here, here's another way to put it. He says, I want you to know, I want to, I want to make sure you know why you're here. You, you're here to be salt. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is no secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think that I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand, and now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. I love this next phrase. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Jesus says that we're here on earth. The purpose that we're here is to be salt and light. Salt makes things better. Light makes things brighter. On my iPhone, I don't know if you can get close to seeing this or not, but on my iPhone is a salt shaker and a light bulb. And beneath it just says, be these. In other words, shake the salt and shine the light. That's what our purpose is. That's why, that's why we're here. That's, that's why we're here. And I have a coaching company and uh, twice a year, thousands of people come in that have just become coaches of ours. And I, I spend a session helping them understand who we are. And the phrase that I teach them repeatedly is this, we are people of value who value people and add value to them. And that's who Jesus expects us to be. In fact, when we, we can say that we are people of value because Jesus looked at the crowd, he looks at us and he says, you're to be salt and light. The very fact that Jesus values us enough to say, I want you to be salt. I want you to be light. I want you to make things better. I want you to make things brighter. I want you to add value to people. Jesus values us so that we can bring value to others. And we only can bring value to others if we, if we really value them. Jesus values you. Jesus values me. In fact, look at your neighbor and just tell them right now, Jesus values you. Go ahead and tell them that. Jesus values you. Look back at them and say, Jesus values me. You said that a little louder than the first one. (laughs) It's 
kind of like Jesus values you. Oh, Jesus values me. Yeah, look at your neighbor and say, Jesus values people that I like. Go ahead and tell them that. Jesus values people that I like. Now look at your neighbor and say, Jesus values people I don't like. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he, 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 he values and loves people that sometimes are a little hard to like. But if we're going to have, uh, if we're going to have and find our purpose in life, it, it begins with valuing people. Recently, I was asked um, in a leadership conference why I put such an emphasis upon valuing people and how in my journey, I got to the place where I just truly love and value people. And I would like to, this isn't even kind of a message. This is very simple. I would just like to share from you, from my heart, for just a few minutes today, how I came to the place of valuing people. As you look at 2023, at Bayside, we want our our, our purpose to be we, we, we value people and we add value to them. By the way, let me just say this. If you don't value people, you won't add value to them. So the, the foundation, the core of adding value to people is it comes from the heart that truly values people. And so I was asked by another leader, in fact, he challenged me, he said, John, you ought to really sometime do a talk on, on how, how it came to be that you valued people. Let, let people in on your journey. And that's what I'm going to do for the next few minutes. And, and really, when I think of valuing people, the first person I have to give credit to is my, my earthly father, my dad. But my father um, just loved people, loved them, valued them greatly. And um, he, he taught me to walk slowly through the crowd. He, he was the president of a college. And literally every day when he'd walk across the campus, maybe he'd only be going 100 yards. It could take him 30 minutes to go 100 yards because he would stop and talk to people and call the students by name and ask how they were doing in school. Sometimes they might say they're having a little difficulty. He'd take their name down and say, now I'm going to pray for you. He just, I, I just, as I watch my father, I, 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 I would keep saying to myself, I want to be like my dad. I, I want to love people. I want to value people. I want to walk slugs through the crowd. And, and when he was 90, he lived to 98. But when he was, but when he was 90, we were, I was over at his house one day, and we were in his office just talking. Having a, what I love most is having these father-son talks. And he said to me, he said, son, isn't it wonderful? The, the older people get, the more they love people. And he's talking about how much he loved people. He said, I, I love people more now than I ever have before. And when he said the older people get, the more they love people, I looked and I said, dad, that's not true. I know a lot of people, they're getting older, but they're not getting better. How many of you know somebody like that, huh? How many of you are, are sitting beside them right now? Okay. <laughs> What I've discovered about age is the fact that as we get older, who we are exaggerates. And, and, and if you're beautiful on the inside, it just exaggerates on the outside. And my father at 90, it was true. It was a true statement for him. He loved people more than he ever loved them before. But it's because he always loved people. And, and, and it, you know, it either exaggerates the positive or it exaggerates the negative. When I graduated from college, that night we were having dinner, and I said, Dad, what, what advice do you have me as I now begin? I started off as a pastor. Where, what advice do you have for me to help me to succeed as a pastor, as a person, as a leader? And he gave me the best advice I've ever received. He said, John, value people, believe in people, and unconditionally love them. He said, if you'll do those three things, people will always want to be around you. He said, value people. Many people don't feel a great deal of self-worth. Believe in people. Some people have never had anybody really believe in them. And he said, if you unconditionally love them, you'll give them a gift that most people have never received in their life. Just unconditionally love people. And that has been my, that's been my guide. And when I write books, I do three things. Love people, value people unconditionally, believe in them. When I teach you, it's, it, that, that's, been the, that's just kind of the grid that I go through. 
And the values lesson my dad taught me with each one of these little stops in my journey, I'll give you a values lesson. The values lesson my dad taught me was very simple. How I value people determines how I view them. If I value you greatly, I will view you greatly. If I, if I put a 10 on your head, I'll look at you as a 10, I'll talk to you as a 10, I'll treat you as a 10. If I put a two on your head, I'll talk to you as a two and I'll treat you as a two. And so it's, it's so important if in adding value to people, of being salt and light, it's so important just, to, just to, to value people. How I view people is how I value people. And then the second area of my journey of valuing people was what I call my evangelism awakening. I was in my first church and I was pastoring. It was a little country church. I had two ladies in my church who had a brother whose name was Jim who never came to church. He wasn't a Christ follower at all. And they asked me to visit him in the hospital, and I did, and I liked Jim. And so about every three days, I would go to the hospital, and for a couple of weeks, Jim and I struck up a great conversation. I'll never forget the day he looked at me and said, boy, my sisters, they love you, Pastor, and I've never been to church at all in my life, but when I get out of here, I'm going to come to church. And I, oh, my gosh, I was so excited. I, I told his two sisters, you know, your brother's going to come to church. They were all excited. I remember one day we were having that good conversation. I left him. And then within 30 minutes, he suddenly died. And my whole world changed. Because I understood that we talked a lot about church and we talked a lot about sports and other things that we were connected with. But I failed to ever share my faith with him. I I failed to ever talk to him about how Jesus loved him and how that he had a beautiful plan for his life and how he wanted to forgive him. And I, I, I didn't get into any of that with him. And all of a sudden, I understood, I realized that my priorities as a Christian were not what they should be. And I, it, took me, it took me months to, to work through uh, my selfishness and my cowardness. And there were just, I had a whole bunch of issues that I had to pray through and, and, and repent and from. And, and, and I, I promised God, I said, God, if you'll just help me win souls, I'll never ask for anything else in my ministry. Just help me to win souls. And, and one evening in my home, the Holy Spirit came upon me in an unusual way and changed my heart and gave me an incredible heart for, for lost people. And, and I'll never even forget, I went back to my church the next Sunday morning and I apologized to them. I said, I've been your pastor, but I've not really had a heart for lost people like I want to. And and, and then we had a little holiness church, and in that tradition, you go to an altar. So when I finished preaching, I, I, I said, I'm just going to go to my altar and publicly before you just, again, repent. And those Christians, they got around me. These farmers, they just loved me. And, and they, it was a beautiful time. And I'll never forget Harvey Condor, one of the older guys in the church. He had his hands, he's had his hands on my head praying over me. And he said, dear God, this is what Ruth and I have been praying for. He realized, he realized I didn't have a heart for lost people. People, when they ask me what my first love is, they think it's leadership because that's what I'm known for through my books and travels and speaking. And I love leadership. Teach it all the time, but it's not my first love. And writing, I love to write. I I just this next week will finish a book. In fact, while I've been here a little bit this morning, even I wrote on, a, on how to receive a return on failure. And, and it off, I, I love writing, but, but writing isn't my first love. I, you know, it, wow, I love speaking, but it's not my first love. My, my first love is sharing my faith with people. I, I want to be salt and light. I want to, I want to, I want to light break in to where light has never been. And I want to, I want, I want to, I want to lift people. And I, and, and it's, it's, it's through Jesus. And the, the values lesson I have received from not sharing my faith with Jim was very simple, that I needed to value people like God valued people, for God so loved the world. And then my third lesson was what I call my zig lesson. <laughs> I'll have to explain that one, won't I? It comes from my friend Zig Ziglar. Many, many years ago, I heard Zig Ziglar when I was just in my 20s. He said, if you'll help people get what they want in life, he said, they'll give you everything that you want. And all of a sudden, my whole paradigm of how I encountered and, and led people changed because up to that time, 
I had a vision and I, I wanted people to get on my leadership train. I wanted to take them on a journey, my journey. And all of a sudden, Zeke says, said, no, 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 forget about yourself. Put others first. You help them get whatever they want in life. And then all the things that you want in life, it'll come to you. And that was the day I realized that the success of my day is based on the seeds I sow, not the harvest I reap. That was the day I realized that, that if I would just put other people first, serve them, help them, add value to them, what can I do for you? That, that if, if my agenda would be your agenda, that the things that I needed in life, they would all come to me. Little did I know that that day Zig Ziglar planted in me the seed that would be the, what I would call the success seed that would allow me to cross over from the church world to the secular world. I'll tell you a little bit about that in maybe seven or eight minutes. But little did I know that day he planted that seed into me. But the values lesson I learned from him was this. Always put other people first. Always. That's not easy because we're, we're naturally selfish, aren't we? That's just who we are. I mean, we are. I mean, I had a lady the other day come up to me and she said, well, I, I, I don't have a selfish bone in my body. And I looked at her and I thought to myself, you're extremely delusional. <laughs> what do you mean you don't have a selfish bone in your body? We all have selfishness in us. That's why putting other people first always is not easy. And if you don't, th- okay, if you don't think you have selfishness in, let me just ask you a question. When you're in a group picture and somebody shows you the picture, <laughs> who is the first person in that picture you look for? And when you find yourself, if you look good, you say, oh my gosh. Great picture, great picture. Yeah. Hey, send it to me. Yeah, send that. Oh, my, yes, yeah, great picture. Way to go. And if you don't look good, what do you do? You say, oh, oh, do it again. Do it again. Come here. Let's, let's do it again. You, let's do it again. And, and you think you don't have any selfishness in you? That's why, that's why in, in valuing people, it, it's a little uphill. It, it, it's naturally to, to want people to take care of us and serve us and and it was just an incredible lesson that I learned from, from Zig. And, and then the next lesson I learned, I really got to explain this, is what I call my hot stove lesson. Mark Twain said, if a cat sits on a hot stove, that cat won't sit on a hot stove again. He said, that cat won't sit on a cold stove either. That cat just don't like stoves. Well, why doesn't the cat love stoves? It's because I had a bad experience with him. In my first church, one of my very first staff members, I loved him. We had such a good time doing ministry together. I was naive. I was young. I thought we'd do ministry all our life together. I was just a wonderful, young, energetic, stupid person. <laughs> and, and, and I'll never forget, it was, he, he went sideways terribly. and I had, to, I had to fire him. I had to let him go. And I was so hurt because I, I gave him everything. I just poured myself into him and and then he just kind of, he just did a U-turn on me. And, and, and I was so hurt, I said, I'm never going to let people get close to me again. See, I'm doing that hot stove stuff. I, I, well, I'm, never, I'm not going to get on that stove again. I'm never going to let anybody close to me again. And so, I, so for the next almost year, I, when I would hire a staff member, I'd say, now, that's your job. This is my job. You do your job. I'll do my job. We'll meet at the Christmas party. <laughs> and, of course, I learned very quickly didn't take me long until I realized that, don't miss this. If you hold people at a distance because they've hurt you, if you had a bad experience with someone and you say, wow, I, you know, just, I got to hold you. What I discovered was when I held my staff at a distance, the good news is they couldn't hurt me, but the bad news is they didn't help me either. And all of a sudden I said, I've got to let, I've got to love people unconditionally and I've got to let them close to me. And, and yes, that, that means that, that there are times when I'm going to be hurt. And the lesson I learned on values there was a beautiful lesson. That is, don't let a bad experience become a lifetime experience. I, I see people all the time. Honestly, one bad experience sets the tone for how they think the rest of their life. 
And then I, I, I learned to value people through what I call my Enron lesson, my Enron lesson. Well, let's first of all, let me just say the word Enron. Do you remember the company in Houston? 2000? And they, they, it was, it was such, supposed to be such a great company, but how they looked on the inside and who they were on the inside was entirely opposite. And they had value, beautiful values on, on, on their walls of how they value, the good values. But they, it, here's what I discovered about a lot of companies. They have good values on the walls, but they don't have good values on their walk. And that was true with Enron, and they came crashing down, and so many people were hurt and lost their pensions, and so many people. And, you know, if you remember, the leaders, in fact, went to prison. And I was writing at that time for Time Warner, and they called me to New York City, and they said, John, we want you to write a book on business ethics. And I looked at him, and I said, well, I can't write a, a book on business ethics. They said, why not? I said, because there's no such thing as business ethics. I said, there's just ethics. You either have them or you don't. And if you do have them, they work in business. (laughs) Oh, happy day. And then they said, well, when you write, couldn't you write a book on ethics? I said, well, I, I don't know. I don't think so. And they said, why? I said, because we, we have a culture that has no truth or absolutes. How, how do you write a book on ethics when everything's jello? And then we thought about it for about a month, and I said, I can't write a book on ethics. And I wrote a book on ethics called The Golden Rule, Ethics 101. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Our research team found that in every country, in every religion, in every culture, there's a golden rule. And so I said, let's just teach this value. Treat others as you'd like to be treated. And that was life-changing for me because up to that point, we were teaching people to live and develop leadership skills, but we weren't weren't teaching enough about leadership values. And and to, to lead well, you have to have good skills, but you also have to have good values. It's on the inside. And and that's when we began to understand that good values live above the law. If you have good values, you won't have any trouble obeying the law. And if you have bad values, you'll, you'll try to get around that law. That, that became the seed for what we do around the world now with countries and transformation, how we transform countries through values, small groups. And so the lesson that I learned there was the fact that great values will give you a great return. If you have good, hey, you want to be bigger on the inside than the outside. You want to be better on the inside than you are on the outside. And when, when that happens if you're, if you're better on the inside than you're on the outside, you'll slowly become better on the outside. If you're bigger on the inside than you are on the outside, you'll, you'll, you'll become bigger on the, the outside. It, it happens, and, and, and it was just huge. And then there was number six, it was my crossover experience. I was writing books to help pastors learn how to lead because when I was 28, I had the 10th largest church in America. And people would come to me and say, how did you build this church? And, and I, I would, I, it's because I understood leadership. So I was trying to help pastors lead because pastors just love people so well. The good news, pastors can get you to heavens, and some of them, they can't help you too much here. And I said, I've got to teach them how to lead people. And so I'm doing these leadership principles for them, and I'm loving it. And, and um, I was at a publishing meeting, and my publisher said, we've done research on your books, and Two-thirds of your books are not being bought by Christians. They're being bought by secular people in the business world, especially in secular bookstores. And I was shocked. I had no idea. I said, you're kidding me. In that moment, in that moment, God spoke and said, John, it's time to cross over. It's time to leave the pastorate and go into the business secular world. And so I crossed over. And uh, I, 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 took the, I took the plan of the Apostle Paul who said, I entered their world and I tried to experience things from their point of view. In other words, I got into their world. And remember I told you that Zig said, if you'll just help people get what they want. Now let's go back to it just for a second. 
I determined how I would cross over is I would do the best leadership teaching that I possibly could, and I would help them build their companies. And if I did that, I would get their respect, and maybe someday I would get their relationships, which would allow me to share Christ with them. You see, when we're brothers and sisters in Christ, we immediately have a relationship with others. But in the business world, you have to get the respect before you get the relationship. And so I said, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to work hard to serve them and do really well with them. And, and it was absolutely, it was absolutely life-changing. I can still remember I was at one of my first times that I, when I crossed over, I was on Kiowa Island speaking to the largest lumber broker company in the world. And at the end of the day, I'd been teaching leadership principles all day. And, and one of the executive vice presidents raised his hand and he said, John, we love this leadership training. It's different. It's fresh. Where did you get your material? <laughs> and I smiled and I said, you, you, you don't want to know. <laughs> and he says, well, what do you mean? Yeah, we don't want to. I said, just trust you. Trust me. My name is John. I'm your friend. <laughs> you don't want to know. One of the things I've learned is that the more you tell people they don't want to know, the more they want to know. And they pressed me, and, and, and I said, okay, I'll tell you, but when I tell you, you're going to be disappointed. I said, everything I taught you today is from the Bible. And they went, oh. I said, I told you we're going to be disappointed. I told you. I said, I see the cocktail hours at 6.30. I'll be there. I'll be over in the corner. If you've ever had a question about God that you just don't understand, just come over and see me. I'll do my best to help you. That night from 6.30 to 7.30, a line formed. And it never ended. And at 7.30 when it was time for dinner, and I left the cocktail hour, I began, this was, this was life-changing to me. I said, people are hungry for God. The reason people don't know God is because they've had a wrong picture of him. And then if I could just give a right picture, that's what Jesus said. If you'll just be salt, if you'll just be light, if you'll, if you'll just add value to people, if you'll, if you'll just value them, it's just absolutely amazing. And so my whole life is, my whole life is with lost people. It's just, I mean, I, I, this is such a treat to be with Christians today. And I've been in worship today and I thought, oh my gosh, this is so good. And tomorrow I go back to sinners. And it's okay because I love sinners, but I love lost people. Love them all. I love people that have values totally opposite of mine. I love them unconditionally. And that unconditional love, just they, they just can't get over me loving them when they feel so unlovable. And, and, and it's so fun and it's so wonderful. So, you know, I, I like hanging out with Christians, but after a while I think, man, I need a breath of fresh air. <laughs> I need to go get back to my Lost people, they, I, I don't know, what am I going to, wow, I got a little dilemma. I want to go to heaven, everybody's going to be saved. What am I going to do? Man, I'm going to go to Christians and say, could you be lost for a moment so I could win you back? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Here's what I know. The closer I am to lost people, the more I love them. And let me explain something for you. The farther you are away from them, the more you'll judge them. Yeah. I can tell when I talk to a Christian how they value, how much they value people and how much time they spend with lost people. There's something about proximity that you begin to see them and you just begin to fall in love with them. You, you see their sin. You see they're, they're as lost as a goose. They're all messed up. And then you just, you just, you just, you just kind of love them. And, and I, that's my world, sharing my faith. I just, I share my faith every day. And, and it's just a beautiful thing to, 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 to value people. And by the way, when you value people, they, they are very open to knowing God. When you, when you, when you have their love and you have their respect and you have credibility with them, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And then there's my heart attack. That's number seven. Hey, at a Christmas party, we had at that time about five companies. We at a Christmas party, I I, um, I had a heart attack. Well, in fact, we were having a good time, a really good time. In fact, 
we were dancing, and I was just having so much fun with all the people. And, and then all of a sudden, I, I had a heart attack, and I thought, oh, my Lord. I mean, you, when you die, you, how did he die? Was he speaking and preaching and changing lives, and adding value to people and quoting Scripture and prayer? No, he was dancing. Just doesn't sound as good. You know what I'm talking about? I, I mean, I thought, I don't pick good times to die. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, and, 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 and it, was, it was a very difficult. I, they had a hard time stopping. It, it, it was in Atlanta, and I, I, I was, oh, yeah, it was just, it was tough. And, and for two hours, they tried to stop the heart attack, and it was, it was a little touchy. And in fact, the doctors told my wife, Martha, said, you let, we have two children, said, let, let your son and daughter come in and talk to him a little bit. And I thought I might be saying goodbye to them for the last time. And I remember as I was laying there, I said, God, you know, is it really? I'm 51. Really? Is this it? I, I mean, I have so much more I want to do. And then he extended my life. And, and I, I will tell you that with, with the extension of life, I just redoubled my efforts to value people and, and just be as Jesus-like as I possibly could and, and it, it was just, it was just, it took me to a whole new level of, of realism and reality about life and, and, and taking, and the values lesson is that I'm just going to value everyone. I'm going to add value to everyone that I possibly can. And then finally, my Jesus walk, my Jesus walk. If you follow the gospels, the thing that you'll come to the conclusion of more than anything else is how much Jesus loved people. And how much he valued people. And he valued them all. He valued them all. And the religious people couldn't handle that. They, they literally couldn't handle how much he loved people that they didn't love. I mean, when he walked into one little town, he sees Zacchaeus who literally is robbing and fleecing everybody in the town. And everybody knows he's a crook. And he says, Zach, he said, let's go to lunch. Do you realize how much that ticked? the Christians off. He's going to lunch with Zach. Doesn't he know who Zacchaeus is? And he's talking to a lady at, that's a Samaritan at the well who's gone through a whole bunch of marriages and has got her whole life all messed up. And In fact, the disciples come back and they can't even, what, what, I mean, what, what are you talking to her for? And then there's a thief on the cross. I mean, hey, hey Jesus just forgives him right on the cross. And come on, today you're going to be with me in paradise. I mean, a woman caught in adultery? I mean, they're getting ready to stone her. You see, while religious people are writing her off, Jesus is writing her in his story. Jesus is bringing her in his story. Just huge. It's just absolutely huge. You see, the values lesson that I see from Jesus is, is just to serve people just to serve people. Let me put it this way. If I see you that you're hurting, I'll help you, okay? If, if I see you're broken, I'll fix you. Don't miss this. But if I see you as valuable, I'll serve you. There's a lot of difference between taking broken people and healing them and taking people that are hurting and pulling them out of it. You see, whenever I do all that, I still look like I'm, I'm kind of almost like the M-I-N-I, the mini Messiah. I, look, look what I did for you. You were in the ditch and I pulled you out. And isn't it amazing? Aren't you glad that you met me and all that stuff? You see, when you're hurting, I'll help you. When you're broken, I'll fix you. I'm still helping you. But when I see you as valuable, I'll serve you. And it's through service it's through loving people, serving people, putting them first, that you get a heart to value them. And it's from that that you help them. And in countries where we do transformation, one of the pictures we use to teach transformation is a ladder, which allows people to climb the, the rung of values on that ladder to, to pull themselves out. But I teach all the time that we don't just give them the ladder, we hold the ladder for them. 
we hold the ladder for them and we, we love on them and we encourage them and we hold it steady and, and they hear constantly. They, they know that, that we want them to climb that ladder more than anything else. And, and I can promise you, when people, know, when people know that you love them unconditionally, when people know that you really care for them, it changes their lives. And what I, my prayer for at Bayside is very simple. As you're looking at your purpose today, my prayer for you is that you'll value people more this year than you've ever valued them. And that you'll love people more this year than you've ever loved them. And you'll serve people more this year than you ever served them. And, and I'm talking about all people, all people. Don't miss this. The church isn't to be a country club. We're not to be a club for Christians. We're to be a a lighthouse for people that are possibly close to the rocks and shipwreck. And I just want you to fall in love with Jesus because the more you love him, the more you love people. And the more you value him, the more you'll value people. And I just believe that God's going to anoint you, Randy, this year to lead your congregation into loving God, loving people, valuing God, valuing people, serving God, serving people. And I believe this is going to be the best year that you've ever had. Because when you put people first, you're just like Jesus. And don't we want to be like Jesus? Don't we want to be like Jesus? Father, thank you for these beautiful people. They are so, they're so beautiful to teach and they've so been so kind to me to listen. This is the year. This is the Bayside year where we value people and love them unconditionally. And may they reach tens of thousands of people for the kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. God bless you. I love you.